name is Richard Wesley, and it's my privilege to be the pastor here at St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. I'm really excited that you're joining with us today. Uh, today's teaching is pretty much directed to the local community called St. Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And I realize that there are many of you who watch this worship experience that may not consider yourselves an active part of this community of faith. You may live out of the state or even out of the country, and I understand that. What I want you to know is that you are welcome. In fact, you're welcomed unconditionally. And that unconditional welcome is the theme of today's teaching. Now, I think there's something that we can all gain from today's lesson, whether it's in our individual lives or our corporate lives as a community of faith. So I'm really excited that you're here with us today. This hymn is uh, something we may not, most of us don't know, and it's called Wounded World That Cries for Healing. Listen to the words or read the words along at the bottom of the screen as it's played. Uh, you'll, you'll know why. Our gospel lesson this morning is found in the book of Mark. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. It was the Sabbath, 
And Jesus entered the synagogue like any other Sabbath. Only this Sabbath was going to be different. Jesus taught from the Jewish common lectionary, and most of the folks that day were impressed. They were looking at each other saying things like, Man, this boy can preach. Uh, someone was shaking Jesus' hand saying, Great teaching today, Rabbi, when just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Just then in their synagogue do you hear the ominous tone in this story? Mark is a master storyteller. Uh, the worship sh service had been good. In fact, it had been very good. Most of the teachers that showed up to teach in the local Capernaum synagogue were predictable and somewhat boring. They drone on and on and on about things like don't pick up sticks on the Sabbath and be sure you don't wear any clothing made out of two different kinds of fabric and, 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 and be real careful not to eat vegetables that are grown together in one field because those are all abominations to God according to the scripture. But this Jesus... He's an interesting fellow. Rather than describing God as some strict, overbearing, note-taking God, keeping record of every slip-up we make, this Jesus presents God as love. He says God loves us and that God desires that we love everyone because God loves everyone. And since God loves everyone, we should make room in our lives for those our culture pushes to the side. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Just then, in their synagogue, two worlds were colliding. There was the world of religion, God's people and the lifestyle of trying to live the way God has called us to live. And there was the world where evil was trying to destroy a fellow member of the human race. A number of years ago, I, I served a church that was growing and reaching younger families. When I was appointed to this particular church, it consisted primarily of middle-aged to older adults, mostly older adults. And the, the, the folks in that local congregation said they wanted to reach younger families with kids. I, I, I told them, Unaffiliated families with kids don't have a lot in common with middle-aged to older adults that made up the bulk of that particular congregation. Well, that didn't matter, they said. That's who we want to reach. I told them a lot of change would have to take place if younger adults with children started attending. That's okay, they said. They assured me that's exactly what they wanted. So we started doing things that would bring in unaffiliated young adults. Well, that's when Juan and Piper started attending our local church. Now, Juan and Piper were a quiet couple, keeping mostly to themselves, not really venturing out to talk to other people, just a, a quiet couple. One and Piper also brought Eli, their five-year-old son. 
Let me tell you, Eli was a handful. He was. It was hard to believe that he was only five years old. He was as big as most 10-year-old kids. But Eli was only five years old. But since Eli looked older, people expected him to act older. But Eli was only five years old. I remember the first time Eli decided to make his way up to visit me in the chancel area while I was delivering the morning message. Now, I actually appreciated the company. You know, most people won't come up here with me while I'm speaking. <laughs> they, they want to stay back. Well, that day I held Eli's hand because that's what Eli wanted to do. And Eli wanted to talk. Well, after church that day and throughout the following week, I heard the complaints. Now, never mind that the complaints came from the very people who said they wanted to reach new, younger families with kids. Now, I've learned that when church people say they want to reach new people, what they frequently mean is that they want to reach new people who have the same ideology, values, lifestyle, and attitudes as they have. What they fail to understand is that usually it is their ideology, values, lifestyle, and attitudes that keep new people from sticking around in the first place. Well, the next Sunday, I invited Eli to join me in the chancel area, and I included him in the teaching that day. Piper loved the attention her son was getting from me. And with the help of a few progressive current members of that local church who were willing to talk one-on-one -on -one with some of the disgruntled folks that didn't like what was going on with Eli, we managed to keep Eli and his parents in that church. It was a good thing that we did. Because none of us could have predicted what this family was about to experience. But it turned out that this family desperately needed a community that had experienced the love of God and was willing to love others with that same unconditional love. After several months, one called the church administrative assistant one day and, and made an appointment to see me. Now, I had been out socially with Juan and Piper on a few occasions, allowing me to get to know them a little better. So when that appointment was made to see me, I suspected it might be serious. Turns out, Juan was turning himself in to the local police department for warrants for his arrest in another state. Before it was over, Piper and Eli moved back to that state to be close to family. Now, I was able to help Piper find a, a good church home that would love her, love one, and love Eli in an unconditional way, the way our church had come to love and appreciate and uh, protect them unconditionally. They had been gone for a few months. When Piper called me one day after Eli had experienced a particular bad day, at school. Piper said, Eli came home from school that day crying, and he said, 
I wish I could go back to my preacher and my church. Wow. There it is. Sometime earlier, a year or two earlier, two worlds had collided in that little United Methodist Church. One world was trying to destroy a young family. One world was trying to live out the love and acceptance of God through Jesus. And that little United Methodist Church heard the message of Jesus and said, Man, that Jesus can lay down a good message. And just then, there was in their church a family that needed their unconditional love. Let us pray. Faithful, covenant God, all your work is full of honor and majesty. Your righteousness endures forever. We come together as your people and give thanks to you with our whole hearts. You send redemption to your people. Holy and wonderful is your name. You have given all thanks for the upbuilding of our souls and our bodies, and so everything is good, but we do not always acknowledge you as the source of our good gifts. As the ones to whom you have given all things, we know we are to handle them with care, but we forget you, and we misuse your gifts, giving offense to others. Forgive our lack of care. Instill in us a new sense of the right use of all things. You promised to raise up your people, Israel, a prophet, and to put into his mouth your word of truth. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we too might be proclaimers of that truth by which the world may be saved. We lift up the names of our brothers and sisters, the names in the bulletin, and the names in our heart who suffer this day. We carry in our hearts others who need your word of healing. The demons of disease inhabit so many people. Some are in pain in their physical bodies, Others suffer the torment of demons in their minds, and still others are weak in their spirit. Speak your command of healing and restore them. We pray to you, not because we deserve your attention, but because you have sent us Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
brings some people to the edge of our lives. Now, this might be the edge of our community life as a community of faith, like one and Piper and that small United Methodist Church. It might be to the edge of our life in our personal relationships. It might happen at school or at work or some other activity that we're involved with. If you don't love those that God brings to the edge of your lives with unconditional love, who will?